We're live at Expert 35. I'm your host, and as promised, expert from 35 different industries, talking about the challenges, the hardships, and the opportunities. Well, today we're going to talk about opportunities. People are starting new businesses. People may have lost their jobs. People may have shifted because the economy is shifting, uh, but there's new opportunities. So nobody better to bring Bradley O'Neill from the O'Neill firm. Hey, you are a lawyer. You know your stuff. And let's talk about LLCs and forming entities. Thanks for joining us today, Bradley. Absolutely. Thanks for having me. Tell us a little bit about how did you get into this? Obviously, you went to law school, right? <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Although, I did, did do that. Yes, sir. Although, yeah. good fun fact, before we jump into that, if you're an engineer and you get your P license, you can then go to other states, take your bar, and then come back to Texas and take your bar. So you don't actually have to go to law school all the time. But you did, right? You went to law school. I did. I did. I went to SMU <laughs> back in uh, 2000. I graduated back in 08 and then worked at a uh, couple of firms for a few years. And then um, I ended up starting my own firm back in uh, 2014. And I've been doing that um, ever since. Uh -huh. So I've really enjoyed it and gotten to meet a lot of night, you know, interesting people and do some interesting things and, you know, help people set up businesses and things of that sort. And you can focus on a lot of different aspects of especially just business, right? What is your primary focus now? Uh, you know, I have, kind of have a broad range of focuses because when I started back in uh, 2014, really had you know kind of a wide range of you know, people I would help out. Really, one of my folk, what I kind of generally do is serve as a general counsel for smaller or mid-sized businesses. So generally, helping them out with more of you know sort of non areas that are not too specialized. Like for example, like things I don't do is usually I don't get involved in you know for like if someone needs a patent or something along those mm -hmm. lines, something that's far too specialized. Right. Certain areas. Certain areas like uh, family law wouldn't get involved in, or you know right. things of that matter. But general, you know, business disputes normally setting up basic agreements, leases, setting up companies, things that you know. And also, I also help individuals often review. Like one thing, I you know kind of got into for a while is reviewing. You know, I represented a few healthcare providers, did uh, did a lot of their employment contracts. From mm -hmm. that, really, I started having a few physicians come to me about, hey, I got my first employment contract. Can you help me review it? And then that sort of spread over the course of several years. And I've done that, you know, a pretty good bit of helping, you know, well, physicians. Initiate. And we talked about that because it's so interesting that now with reopening, especially if you're a restaurant or if you're in an exposure area and, and your employees are very concerned that you can help them rewrite that because an employee contract isn't what you sign the first day. You can always bring a new employee contract, right? Because they, they can sign a new contract now. It depends. I mean, the, if the contract is at, you know, if it's employment at will, obviously the terms can theoretically, you know, change during the course of the uh, employment. If it's, you know, long-term employment contract where it's something where if someone signs a contract for five years or something like that, and then you try to mm -hmm. you know, change the compensation or something like that, then it becomes more complex. You know, you run into some different issues there. But yeah, norm, most employment relationships are always at will and more governed by you know, just the policies of the company and things like that. And so there they can generally change. And so. Perfect. Well, we're going to talk a lot about the opportunities, forming out, you know, entities, getting into business. Uh, if you need an attorney, text expert 19 and you'll get Bradley's information, contact info. If you want to join the conversation, you can always text expert 35. We're looking for people on the show. In fact, we're going to have two shows today because uh, we're later on this, uh, this morning, we're going to talk about, designers and that space and how to make that space your own. Uh, but this morning, man, the first question people talk about is like, Hey, I just started, I ran down the street. I got my DBA. I'm in business. <laughs> What's wrong with that? <laughs> it's a generally a good idea to basically always, one of the first things you should always do, you know, generally if you're setting up or, you know, if you start conducting a business and it starts becoming a commercial enterprise of any sort, where it's something that you want to do as your career, something with any kind of significant liability or even something earning, you know, even any decent amount of money, it's always a good idea to set up a limited liability company. Filing a certificate of formation in the state of Texas is really easy to do, not a hard, difficult process. You know, it can get more complex depending on the complexity of the company, but the basic setup of an LLC is really very easy to do and something that's highly advisable for, you know, anyone to do. Now, filing it is pretty easy. Like you got to basically, you can go to the website. Oh, I even skipped, on, skipped the process. You can go to the website uh, to file, like, you know, you have to get a certificate of formation. What's that process like? And obviously working with a lawyer is always recommended, but you can do this on your own, right? It's just like filling out some paperwork. 
In theory, you can. And it depends on the resources of the, um, you know, it's a very easy thing to fill out. Like, and so mm. it's not, not a hard, not a hard process. And usually even before the certificate, they try to advise, you know, people how to do it. They try to make it simple so people mm. could, you know, theoretically do it. It's not always, you have the resources to hire an attorney. It's worth the expense to do that. Just because sure. it's somehow wrong on there, not the way you want it set up, there can be, you know, adverse, you know, consequences from that. That being said, filling it out, it's literally, you know, it asks for the name of the company, making sure that there's not another match to the name. Then you've got the address, you know, basically who's going to own it, the registered mm -hmm. agent of who, you know, if it were to get sued, who's going to get served. Then it has sub, you know, supplemental provisions, which you don't even have to, you know, fill in. Then you have member managed or manager managed. And so it's not a very hard list of things to actually set up the entity. Mm -hmm. But then you run to your next step, which sometimes you see people will set up the entity then they try to go to the bank to get a bank account. Right. Is to go get the EIN, you know, is to get the EIN number. And so that's the, um, another reason why it's advisable when you start a business to set up your, um, the LLC is so you can have a bank account for your business, right. which is another process you do through the um, IRS, which is ironically about as, you know, not, it's also not a hard process to do, but it's about the same Form, amount of form filling, I would say, is setting up the actual LLC is getting the EIN. Sometimes I've seen some where it's more complicated to do that for various right. reasons. But well, and before we jump in there, because I mean, filling the SS4 form and like, getting the tax ID number, those are, you know, that's protocol. But let's talk about the basics. Right. What's the difference between me going out and getting a DBA and me getting an LLC? Like, what does that make a difference? Is it going to be harder for my taxes if it's just me? I guess we'll talk about single member LLCs, but just me getting an LLC and a DBA. Liability protection is the biggest thing. And sometimes it doesn't give people as much, for, you know, there's certain things that, give, that it does do and certain things it does not. So for example, mm -hmm. let's say you go out and you lease a uh, property and you have an LLC and the lease is only with your LLC, mm -hmm. that gives you, you know, protection there. That if the LLC, you know, if the, you know, basically for the, uh, the, you'd have a contract and you could say that contract is only with my LLC and not with me personally. And so the person is contracting with this separate um, entity, but, you know, and then they, um, you know, in reality though, that uh, the protection it doesn't give you is first, a lot of contracts, people sign what's called a personal guarantee, meaning that's why they would personally guarantee the uh, debt of the, uh, or let's say for that lease, they would be a guarantor on it or, you know, for any kind of lawsuit, like let's say any kind of act someone personally does, normally just because you have an LLC wouldn't always mean that, you know, if somebody personally does something, couldn't lead to any type of liability. It also comes in handy when you have multiple partners though, because if you have five people in an LLC together and you have person A does X, Y, Z that leads to some type of liability, what the LLC can often do is protect the other people in there who might have not been you know, not had, you know, been involved in that and just only merely been an owner of the company or something of that sort. Great, great info, right? And it's important. The liability, people don't understand that if they, if you don't have an LLC, they can come after your personal assets. Like you can right. have things that aren't even part of your business. Mm -hmm. And now because you don't have an LLC, the LLC can be like, no, this is all I use for my business. I didn't yeah. use that car. I didn't mm -hmm. use these computers. I didn't use the tablet, you know, and so it is a, uh, a, a layer of protection, but you, I still recommend you get insurance. <laughs> and yeah. I think we have that common mistakes to avoid, right? Like still you want to yeah. make sure, and let's, mm -hmm. let, before we jump into the slide, you know, the, uh, I got a great question. Greg's asking, uh, let's cut, let's hide our names. Now we can, can't see anything. What's the first step that you need to take after deciding to start a business? I would say it's, you know, really setting up the um, LLC because you're going to need to set up a bank account for that business. To do that, you need to have the EIN number. And mm -hmm. so to the extent it's any kind of, you know, significant commercial enterprise, then yeah, I would say setting up the LLC would be, if not the first step, it would be right up there. And you said something earlier that was really interesting. When you file the LLC, it's almost like a search that that name doesn't exist Texas wide, right? right. A DBA is only countywide. So just because you get the DBA and you call yourself Pool Depot, uh, which is actually one of my clients, actually, <laughs> Pool Depot, doesn't mean that somebody can't be Pool Depot, you know, in Travis County down the street. So um, Jennifer's got a great question. How long does the process take uh, filing TIN number? I guess, how long does it take for you to come, come up with the idea to where you can deposit a check in the bank? 
So oh, uh, very quick, like it can literally be within, um, you know, usually when you, fi the filing process is online. There's two ways you can be, or I guess probably you can either send the forms to the uh, Secretary of State. Now the most common way is you just file it online. And usually they say it's between 24 to 48 hours, I believe, but normally you get it back within a day. I mean, it's literally within, you know, I always try to tell people about three to four days, but normally you'd be, you you're up, you know, it's usually get your approval very, very quickly. And it's not, you know, occasionally you'll have an issue with the filing where you can have, you know, one, you know, for example, some entities, whether or not the name should be, there's an entity called PLLC, where it's like if it's for a professional person that needs to be licensed. Mm -hmm. So you can occasionally have issues about the, or you could have a name where people say it's too similar or things of that sort. Normally you're looking at, you know, basically no more, you know, 24, 48 hours, something like that. Not long. No, that's super fast. Super yeah. fast. Here's a great question from Jennifer because you kind of addressed it. What do you tell people who say they can do it all on their own? Normally I say it depends, like, because <laughs> they, uh, it depends on the person and it also depends on their resources and stuff, you know, because if somebody has, you know, $500 or not very much money in their bank account to do, you don't want to, you know, charge them a bunch of money to go file the, you know, when you can theoretically, the state has it designed where they could, you know, try to go through it and get it set up. So they, um, and so it really depends if the, but then you have certain people who are setting up a large, you know, company where they could project to have something really valuable or they have some, you know, have plenty of resources to afford an attorney. And that's where, you know, if you're setting up, you see some of those where it's two people who set up something where, you know, it's a potentially larger business and they tried to do everything on their own. And then essentially it causes a bigger mess than what the, had they just hired an attorney in the first place. So it really right. depends on the circumstances of that person and what they're trying to set up and, you know, what the, ultimate objectives of the company are and stuff like that. But normally not advisable, advisable to get an attorney if you can. Yeah, totally talk about this because I started on a budget and I had, in fact, the first advice I was given is to put LTD after mm -hmm. my name because that makes you limited. And apparently that's only in Canada. Yeah. So <laughs> I learned the hard way. Uh, and if there's anything, piece of advice, we'll talk about some of the common mistakes. But when you choose your LLC name and you don't actually have to file your your brand as your right. LLC name. It's right. almost better to have like an operating name, right? And then you can have DBAs. And we were talking offline. You, there's there's a serious LLC, which is a little complicated, but you can now have multiple LLCs. You want to talk a little bit about that? Yeah, like actually it was something I looked at last night and I'd read about it before and dealt with it in a litigation case I was doing, but then had a, but actually had done some research on it last night, a series LLC is a type of LLC that basically you create and where it's commonly used for real estate holding companies and things mm -hmm. like that, where what it does is you create one, you know, you know, you know, basically a parent LLC, you put specific, right. you know, language in your company agreement and as well into the uh, formation documents, basically allowing you to create these series LLCs that are sort of below the uh, parent company that almost operate like subsidiaries, but the, under the, what's the Texas business organizations code, they have a lot of the same protections as a um, as an LLC would have. The problem is they're relatively new in the state of Texas, so they're a little more you know. It's so they're you know I guess the number amount of case law on them. If somebody were to really try to you know just try to I guess for liability try to divide it up among the series, how protected mm -hmm. they would be. It's not totally tried and tested yet, I guess. But it's um, but you know potentially beneficial to certain types of um, companies, especially. You know, if you're owning a large number of properties or something like that, it's something that, you know, has some, you know, potential benefit for sure. And let's talk about these common mistakes to avoid, right? Mm -hmm. uh, the slide's right. been up for a little while, but we kind of bounced around really important concepts. But what are some of these uh, mistakes that you see people jump into? Okay, yeah. So I guess the first one we talked about, no insurance. And then the second one is that they, uh, you know, no detailed company agreement in 50 50 ownership i guess these kind of go together so you see a lot of these where people will go you know into a company with it's just two friends who start a, a company together i don't think they need to consult any type of attorney because you know they they're all friends and everything's going to be fine and you know they don't want to spend money on a lawyer so it's either some kind of like really not very well done you know company agreement that doesn't define what's going to happen if there's a dispute 50-50, automatically you're at high risk of having a dispute because if you ever disagree on anything, 
you know, who controls, you know, who gets to make what decision. And what you end up having a lot in that situation is deadlock. And deadlock can be a disastrous thing for a, a company because you have the, um, you know, you can have some huge, you know, at that point, if one guy owns 50%, the other guy owns 50%. And they, there's some huge decision that they fundamentally disagree on, you know, who controls. And it can often lead to, you know, disputes that otherwise wouldn't need to happen if people consult an attorney beforehand. Greg's got a great follow-up question. It's like, what extra steps do I need to take if I take on a partner? Um, you know, and that kind of goes in, I guess, to having the detailed company agreement. And what a, one good thing with a company agreement is that usually they're, they're pretty standard form, you know, documents. And what it kind of does is let you go through it, the, the partners, and kind of figure out these are some issues that might kind of come up. Like, for example, what happens if somebody uh, wants to transfer their shares? What happens if somebody passes away? How do we decide if there's going to be distributions? You know, when are we going to meet? How often do we need to meet for the... Uh, you know, company, you know, just so many different, you know, is there going to be a non-compete or confidentiality provisions? So many different things that can kind of, uh, you know, come up. And so those, you know, basically going through that process, it might, it's possible, you, you know, usually people agree on pretty standard company documents, but it puts something in place where everybody knows sort of they're on the same page when they start the, you know, company. Ideally, you never need it, but if you, but it comes in handy if you ever do. I think you nailed it, right? This is why lawyers exist, right? It's mm -hmm. not, you don't actually want to need a lawyer. <laughs> it's like mm -hmm. a seatbelt. But if you have it and you've, if you spend the resources in it, one of the things that's going to happen if you're in business and you're a growing business, at some point mm -hmm. you're going to have a dispute. You're going right. to have a dispute as you grow. People have different strategies. People have different ways of growing. They have different needs and their needs, their life changes. Right. And right. so it's really fun. I deal with a lot with startups and it's super fun talking about all the fun stuff. I'm like, oh, we're going to make millions. But then let's talk about the hard stuff. Like what happens if, you know, with insurance, what happens if somebody gets hurt? What happens if somebody can't do the work? What happens if somebody has to move and like, or just, mm -hmm. you know, they, they can't dedicate as much time or somebody puts the money and somebody puts the time. All those things are really important. And that's why a lawyer can really help you work through those. Uh, mm -hmm. One of the things you kind of take the emotion out of it, right? There's, uh, mm -hmm. we're all charged. It's our baby. And, and you can kind of tell us as a lawyer, you can tell Hey, your baby, your baby's not that pretty. <laughs> mm -hmm. Right. Uh, yeah. Taking on a partner is super important. Right. And, and a lot of people need to kind of work through, mm -hmm. through those agreements. Uh, Bradley, what are, what, what do you see is like the best way to start, building like confidentially confidentiality agreements and non-compete. What are good resources for that? Uh, they can get very, very complex in the uh, state of Texas. And the one thing that's important to remember is that in this, you know, a lot of times there are a lot of non-competes out there. Having a non-compete in place and having an enforceable non-compete are two different, um, you know, things. And so normally what you want to have though is in an agreement to basically figure, you know, obviously if two people are starting a business to each other, they owe, often a fiduciary, you know, relationship to not go out and, you know, take the confidential information of the business or not go out and start a competing, you know, enterprise. Or if they're, you know, to the extent they are going to do that, everybody wants to be on the same page. So what normally you do is have a, um, you know, either if you do have that type of provision is have something in place where it basically will say, you know, that basically you can't do X or what you can't do you know, while you're a member of the company and for a certain amount of you know time afterwards, normally have a geographic range. It has to be limited normally in time and scope. And then it also has to usually protect a you know, legitimate interest, which normally it can in a uh, company agreement, but it does get, you know, sort of complex. Sometimes you have issues where if, you know, if your non-competes basically too broad and not really protecting anything and not, you know, for example, if it goes and protects, uh, if I'm an industry that operates in, industry a and i tell them you can't com you know compete in you know that industry and something totally different and they're doing something that's not hurting you at all it can become questionable whether or not the court will enforce it but sure. one thing you also want to have is a provision in there that says that that basically a party can go try to get what's called an injunction you know to stop because if someone breaches the non-compete by the time you know if you just sued them for it you know usually the damage can be done by the time you'd ever go to court and so that's the purpose of what's get you know getting what's called a temporary restraining order that would theoretically you know basically preserve the status quo while you're litigating the non-compete but that's generally a whole body of you know law in texas and elsewhere and certain attorneys almost do nothing but that and yeah. handle the disputes 
Well, Jennifer's asking, like, what happens if something goes wrong? Do you? It depends on the uh, complexity of the dispute, the size of the company, you know, different things. But often I do. It's stuff like that. The only times I ever won't is when it gets really, really, you know, when you get into some really, really complex stuff. Like, I don't know, normally I try to stay out of anything involving securities laws and stuff like that. That's where you have certain times where mm -hmm. somebody will be an investor in a company or an owner, but they'll be an aggrieved owner and claim that the company somehow had a you know, that they had basically issued securities without following the proper, you know, guidelines, stuff like that. And so, you know, so normally I would try to stay out of anything along those lines, but enforcing non-competes, I would normally do, except with the, if you're dealing with, it depends once again on the size and scope of the company. If you're dealing with something right. involving millions of dollars, you'd want to do somebody who does nothing but, you know, these kind of trade secret litigation cases and stuff. Right. Right. Well, and that's important, right? And she, her also her follow up question was, what about out of state clients? Well, you're licensed in what state are you licensed in? Just Texas. And so I'm just okay. licensed in the uh, state of Texas. And so it's, it, you know, there's some limited things you can kind of do out of it's becoming harder and harder because, you know, as you know, work crosses, you know, state. Where you can get admitted to a court from another state with another attorney. And stuff yeah. like that. I really don't do that. I mean, most of my practice is all in uh, Texas. I've had a few matters come up here and there, where they, um, where they, you know, where I've just been able to, you know, help people out in, you know, different states. But it's really normally important to kind of do practice in your own. And you know, so I really try to stay in my own, you know, stay in the own area and do stuff here. Yeah, stay in your corner. But when you file, and the, you know, to answer Jennifer's questions, uh, we've got contractors, we've got employees in different states. Right. But when we they sign the agreement, we usually there's a line on there that says that this would be the jurisdiction is Texas, and that if we go to a dispute, it's going to be done in Texas. Absolutely. And, right. And so that that mean that that means yeah, you're I'm the client. It doesn't matter where I'm from. If I'm if my LLC is in Texas you can manage that dispute because it follows the laws of Texas, correct? Absolutely. And I also help a lot with vendor agreements. It's one of the most important things that we're not, what it's, you know, a lot of times when people get these vendor, you know, agreements with vendors and stuff like that, they'll have the, uh, you know, they'll, they'll always have this, you know, a dispute resolution provision where the vendor is from sometimes in very obscure places too. Like, you know, we had one where it was a, I had one client who hadn't done a, um, you know, ended up getting sued in rural Iowa. And like wow. it was because that's where they, uh, you know, the vendor was from and makes it almost impossible. The thing was over about 20 something thousand dollars, if I remember. But it was, um, but, you know, if you get sued in a very obscure, you know, location, you have to go try to find an attorney there and do all that, right. which really makes it, you know, more questionable whether or not it's worthwhile, which is why it's important to, you're much more likely better to protect your rights by defending any case in your home jurisdiction. Then again, so is the other person, which is why people can frequently disagree over what, you know, venue should be in there. Well, and I'll just drop uh, one of our OG experts was Beth Revere. She is a she is an arbitrator, right? Or she goes through the process of facilitating communication. And sometimes, you know, before you you know you get to a dispute, before you even file in court, you can just go to a mediator. That's the right word, right. a mediator. And it's just there's always four sides to every <laughs> every argument, and well, the last thing you want to do is just really get into this hill where like you can't back out, right? right. Absolutely. And uh, and the the legal documents that you you're you're setting the guidelines before, right? Uh, it's kind of like let's go political. Kind of like the presidential debates last night. They're like, hey, mm -hmm. you agreed to this, like why are you not doing it, <laughs> right? And that was the way the facilitator could push the ball down the line. Well, that's how you can push the ball down the line with your employee, with your partners. Uh, great information. Uh, you know, one of the things that uh, that we can talk about too is LLCs kind of separate you a little bit, right? But as a single member, talk to your CPA because right. the filing yeah. is just a Schedule C. It's not that complicated and you can deduct right. things properly and just get a lot of benefits, especially sure. as a startup. So, uh, you know, again, if you've got, if you got questions, for for Bradley, you can text expert nineteen and you get his contact info. My favorite part of the show, Bradley, is we talk about man three things to do now. So, what do you recommend? Three things. Go. Well, the three things, I guess, is once when you're starting a business, it's considering your resources. You know, what's your budget and what do you need? Like that's you know kind of step one for you know for setting up your business. Then most likely step two, I guess, would be creating a separate entity. And I guess 
maybe this is two steps in there, but it also obtaining insurance from almost anything you're going to do as a, you know, you know, as a, uh, as a business, if you have any, you know, for liability risk, stuff like that. Number three, if you have a business partner, you know, have some clear terms beforehand on how the relationship or how the company is going to operate, which normally involves having a company agreement in place. And Perfect. So I three things. Yeah. yeah, no, perfect. That's such good information, right? And insurance, like I went through, you know, as a startup, I was always worried about like, what can I afford? I'll tell you what, it's like insurance, like both the legal payment. So if you don't know what you're doing, reach out for a lawyer and oh, I guess extra, extra things to do. If you're trying to find somebody as an expert like Bradley, what should they look for? How can they figure out that they're as qualified as you? Like, can they look for their board certifications? What are quick little things you, you would recommend somebody do in the background? I would say normal, often attorney recommendations, recommendations from people you know and stuff like that. Internet's not always the best source on lawyers and stuff like that. On the, uh, you, know, <laughs> you, know, the you know, Google, you know, like usually getting like the Yelp reviews and stuff like that. It's not always going to give you, yeah, you know, they could sometimes be a little different than the performance you get. Not always. I mean, there's a lot there, but usually in any area, there's plenty of, you know, great lawyers out there. It's finding someone you feel comfortable with who can work with you and make sure you get within a budget that you, you know, that everybody is on the same, you know, page about what they're going to spend, things like that. And that's right. the, uh, usually if you feel comfortable with them, most of them will do a good job. Excellent. And make sure that they're licensed in your state. Again, that's important. So that's yeah, not, not licensed is, you know, if, if they're not licensed and they do the service, you could theoretically get all your money back, but it's not going to be fun to have a lot more damages than that. Yeah. And something I picked up on you earlier, and I really want to kind of drive in, his honesty was really important. You heard Bradley say, hey, look, I can help you file for like a trademark or some, a registered mark, but it's 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 a different group, right? Make sure the lawyer doesn't tell you he can do everything. You don't want the lawyer that can do your 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 planning and your business and your litigation. Like you want like to really focus uh, because it's too much to know. And if they know, you know, like what to say, um, Jack of all trades, master of none. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, no, exactly. That, and it depends. When you get there's certain areas you get where they're too specialized. Like for mine, like what I always do is I look at it like if I was a doctor, it's like being a general practitioner or something like that. Where there's certain mm -hmm. things, proceed, you know, things you can do, where it's like you know reviewing a lease or something like that. That's not right. you know they could be some complexities into it, but not necessarily. And they uh, and the because one thing the problem you can get going to too many lawyers is that you can have like uh, you know let's say you have a different lawyer for every different area. So one thing that can be a lot of value to a client is knowing the business, the background of things that they can't just tell you from right, you know, that you've just worked with them for so long, you can know it. So there's a huge amount of, you know, value in that, but it comes with a limitation where if something gets to the point where it's too specialized, you got to know that this is too, you know, this is an area that's right. too, it's getting too complex. And it's, it's something that there's certain areas where you always want to outsource it, but, but you do run into problems where attorneys don't outsource it and that then you can run into issues. All right. Bradley, so good having you on the show. So timely. People are filing for DBAs like I've never seen before. So I can only imagine this is important for them to hear. It's like, hey, insurance, LLC, tax ID number. Uh, again, if you want to get in, in touch with the O'Neill firm and talk to Bradley, text expert19 to the number on the screen. I uh, would love to have you back. Uh, there's just so much to uncover and learn more about the serious LLCs. And just we got questions about what about incorporating Delaware and Nevada? Like, <laughs> man, uh, can of worms. <laughs> I'll get on answering some of these for sure. That's a, yeah, that's a really great. I've really enjoyed having being on here. Thank you so much for being on the show. Would love to have you back, and uh, we'll see you soon. Sounds good. Thank you so much, Gabriel. Thanks. Appreciate it. All right, guys. That was Bradley O'Neill from the O'Neill Firm. This week, actually, we're going live again. We're going to talk about why you should have an expert designer helping you re create your space, whether it's for business or for pleasure. And uh, we'll have Teresa on later on today. Next week, we've got a full lineup. So join us on Expert 35. If you text Expert 35, the number on the screen, uh, we'll be happy to like interview you, put you on the air. Uh, just we'll try to get everybody through this. Again, stay safe. We'll see you soon. This is Gabriel. Bye. We collaborate at Expert 35. This is for a better tomorrow and a better Day. Let's come together and together we will find a way. You got questions, we got solutions. You got problems, we got resolutions. Visit expert35.com. No need to worry.
we just remain calm. remain calm No more pain, no more sorrows We provide solutions for a better tomorrow, tomorrow. No more pain, no more sorrows We provide